The CW Twin Cities presents See What's Now, your entertainment news source. Three, two, one. <laughs> hey! <laughs> well, we made it pretty far that time. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Ready? Three, Three two, two, one. <laughs> Should I give it? Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. one. All right. Hey, everybody, John Foss, CW Twin Cities. And this is kind of insane because somehow we got Tim Meadows in the house. Hey. What are you doing here? How do we pull this off? I'm, I can't believe it. I'm impressed by your management that they mm -hmm. would actually get me down here because I usually don't do things like this. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, Sophia, she runs the place basically. She somehow pulled it off and fixed the boiler before this interview. So it was pretty amazing. Are you impressed? That. I'm super impressed. In fact, I don't even think she should be in Minnesota. I think she should be like in New York or LA where you can hmm. really appreciate somebody who works as hard as, you know, as Sophia. So, cause you're, look, you got me here. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. I know that's amazing, but I will say you're here in Minnesota playing the joke joint this weekend, Thursday, yeah. Friday, Saturday, but you basically just um, insulted the entire state of Minnesota by saying that anybody that is good at stuff like Sophia should not be in Minnesota. Like, are well, we look, second class citizens if, here or what? Well, if Minnesota is insulted by that, then uh, Minnesota is too sensitive. Okay. And well, grow up. It's Minnesota nice here. We can't really take any criticism. So. Well, I'm sorry, but okay. you know what? I, you know, I think you can. I think anybody in America, like if you're working somewhere locally, you know, wherever, mm -hmm. and especially in this business, and you want to like get better at it, you have to go to New York or L.A. eventually. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm well, just trying to. I'm trying to open up Sophia's uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. That's all. Yeah, I think we, she deserves better than we're, you. We're holding her back. You, yeah. See, you obviously don't have a lot of faith in her. Mm -hmm. Whereas I just met her like 20 minutes ago, and I think she should be a nationally known producer. <laughs> I agree, but so should I stay? Or here? boiler operator. <laughs> exactly. Should I stay here then? I haven't Based seen much of your talent. Yeah. So you've seen the best so far. Of what of you? My talent. Yeah. Okay. It's downhill from here. Well, you should stick around here for a little while and get better at it mm -hmm. and then head out to, I don't know, maybe go to Chicago next. Okay. Like, I think you should workshop this like other small cities in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whereas I think Sophia can go from here to NBC in New York. Mm -hmm. Just skip the minor leagues altogether. She's done it already. All right. She stopped the boiler from making noise before this thing. Mm -hmm. You didn't do anything. No, I just sat here. You sat here and what we, what we both did mm -hmm. actually and just watched it happen. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. So I, in doing research for this interview, found probably the best hidden gem on the internet on Amazon Prime, which mm -hmm. is the Rose Parade hosted by Korg and Trish. Cord and Tish. Cord and Tish. Yeah. All right. Well, how did this happen? And tell the people a little bit at home about what it is. Well, it was it's sort of a parody of, of <clears throat> parade coverage. You know, like, you know, you see the Thanksgiving parade or whatever. And Will and Molly... They and uh, the writers from Funny or Die approached it as we're going to have these two fake correspondents cover the parade, and also we're going to have Tim Meadows as himself. And so our con the conceit was that we've done this for years, and we're a team. Twenty-five years. Yeah, and uh, in the last six years, I've sort of asked them to stop bringing up Saturday Night Live during the broadcast, uh, and so. But they do it regardless. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what it was about, and it was live. It was on Amazon. It was the first time that they, first time ever that they, there was like a parody parade show. Mm -hmm. You know that was live, and the responses from people were, were beautiful because a lot of people thought it was real and were annoyed by it, and then the people that knew it was a fake enjoyed enjoyed it yeah. you know so it was a blast you know and well, one of the best things i think is when a lady during the parade is yelling at you to get a, to get out of, out of the way because you're blocking the view yeah so <laughs> and she was walking by you know mm -hmm. uh as if like so she was coming from somewhere else but that was just that just happened and i was mm -hmm. very polite to her and you know whereas i could have at first i was thinking i should just rip on her mm -hmm. but you know she was like an old lady, though. <laughs> yeah. So it wouldn't, I would have turned the audience against me. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was fun, man. I hope we, we there's some talk that we might do something else soon. Anything you can tease? I can't really divulge. I don't okay. think I should yet, because it's all sort of being worked on. Mm -hmm. But we're definitely, I'm speaking as if I'm, you know, going to be in it every year. But I think we're definitely going to do another Rose Bowl parade. So okay. I can say that. Cool. Hopefully we'll get 25 years of that. Mm. So speaking of people annoying you by asking SNL questions, 
you went, you were brought into SNL without having to audition, and not only that, you thought you were hired as a writer, mm -hmm. and then you got there and found out you were going to be on camera. What was it like to hear that news and then to see yourself on the opening credits for the first time? Uh, the, well, to hear that news, you know, it was a little bit convoluted because, I don't know, back then there was a little, I don't know, I kind of feel like they were a little bit more unspecific about jobs and like, because they had a big cast already. So when I went out for my meeting, it was just sort of, I was under the impression that it was a writing job mm -hmm. uh, because they already had Chris Rock on the show. And, um, and so when I went for the interview, that's what I kind of thought it was all about. And, uh, and then when I came back to New York after, to, to work, it was sort of explained to me that I, you, you're gonna be a featured player and also we want you to write for the show too. And it was, I, I, I was like, I was stunned and delighted, you know, mm -hmm. and, but it was also like, you know, I don't know, I don't even know how to best describe it. It was like, I just kind of felt like, well, I can't say no. Um, and I'm very appreciative, but like my, my whole overall feeling whenever, when I worked at SNL that first year, and that's truly, really, this is the truth, is that I thought somewhere during the week, somebody's going to come out like an executive from NBC and go, uh, you, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Get, you know, pointing me and telling me to get out. The imposter Cause, symptoms. Yeah, it was like, cause uh, you know, like four or five years before I was an office manager in Detroit and going to college. Mm -hmm. And so in that period of time that it just, I was like, I still felt that's who I was. I didn't feel like, oh, I'm, mm -hmm. the, I'm an actor, writer, comedian now, you know? So yeah, I had, uh, it was a weird feeling, yeah. And before that, you were in Second City, and maybe maybe people at home don't know this, but with uh, Chris Farley, mm -hmm. what, and and you you talked in the past about Lauren Michaels going there to see Chris Farley, and you just thought it was there to see him, not to see you. Mm -hmm. I guess my question for you is: you guys have a, a very different humor. He's very over the top, mm -hmm. very physical humor, mm -hmm. whereas you have subtle humor, which um, which I love, and a lot of people do, but. Was it tempting to, with him getting all that attention, to try to be something that you weren't? Or how did you stick to, to what, what you were, what, the kind of comedian that you were? Well, I guess by that time, I was like smart enough and seasoned enough in improv and everything that I, I sort of knew my role in, in the sketches and the improv that we did. And with Farley, you really, you really had to serve the scene. You had to sort of be the guy who asks questions to the person you're working with, you know, mm -hmm. and to not over and not overreact to the things that he gives you back. So I'm this, I was a straight man, and I knew in the, in some of those scenes you just have to play that role, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never been tempted to go outside of doing. I, I've never been tempted to do things that I'm uncomfortable with, you know. Like I I sort of know what I like to do, mm -hmm. and me trying to out energy and out big and Farley is crazy because right. he's just really funny. Mm -hmm. But I think people at SNL and when they came to see me um, work, they realized that the job that I had to do is also hard to do because you have to keep it moving. You have to like introduce ideas into the scene for him to go off on, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and so I think they, that's probably why they probably thought of me as a writer first, you know. Who, who uh, was the most talented cast member that you that you worked with while you were on the show? On uh, SNL? Mm -hmm. Man, I don't know, man. I don't know. Like it, it was like so many really talented people. Like, but like people, have, you know, people. Some people had like strengths doing certain things, but I would say like Phil Hartman was probably the person that can encompass all of those things that you want in a sketch player. I mean, he could do accents, he could do characters, he could play the straight man, he could be the funny guy. Um, he had a weird sort of sensibility about him when he was just being himself. Mm -hmm. um, and he was really, um, and he was almost also like a throwback to like earlier comedians, like, you know, like, uh, Abin Costello and, 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 you know, Lauren Hardy and people like that. Like, he had some, like, history behind him. So he was, like, just really versatile. 
I did. I wrote a sketch for Phil when I was there, like my second year. It was called Soap Opera Digest, and it was with uh, Alec Baldwin. And Phil, in, in the scene, Phil is playing a uh, soap opera actor. And the lines that I wrote for him were not funny. And there was like points where like, you know, they do close-ups of the two actors and there's a musical sting under it. Mm -hmm. And it's just a camera shot of Phil mm -hmm. just sort of looking at Alec Baldwin and like doing that soap opera thing. Yeah. And there was no reason that people should have been, when I wrote it, it wasn't written to be a laugh. It was written to sort of be like, this is how soap operas look. Mm -hmm. But Phil got a huge laugh just on his staring at Alec Baldwin. And it was like a, sort of a revelation to me of like, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be big or, you know, you know, like the comedy, it'll come if you are just, if you just commit to it. Mm -hmm. And that's what Phil was doing during those camera shots. Okay. He was like committing to the idea that he was a soap opera actor on a soap opera. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. Okay. I think was Mike Myers also was one of those people too. It's just, <clears throat> he could just do it all. He could do accents and he, pl he played straight men. He had characters. Um, and he had a sort of fun vibe to him. So when you were watching him as an audience member, you could sense that he was having fun with it. Mm -hmm. Was there a cast member that you thought was the best of all time that maybe made you want to get into it? Well, for me, uh, from SNL, it was mm -hmm. probably Bill Murray, Chevy Chase. I mean, I was in high school during those years. Um, and so I, I would say like those two and had the biggest comedic influence on me as far as SNL is, uh, goes. Um, and even Ladies Man is hugely indebted to Bill Murray and Caddyshack. Because mm -hmm. I've always approached that character as with the same sort of attitude that the, uh, that his golf, uh, the, the character in uh, Caddyshack has. Which is like, you know, everything is cool and I'm fine, you know. Mm -hmm. And Lady the Man was like that too. He's just like, yeah, listen, it's all good. <laughs> you know, he can handle anything. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but that attitude, and I, I would often think of Bill Murray when I like go news. into that character or when, you know, right uh, whatever. So with somebody like you that went through a, your career and did, did something, did improv, did SNL, had a very successful um, on-camera career, which is still going, mm -hmm. what inside of you gave you the, made, made you brave enough or want to step outside your box, step outside the box enough to, uh, to take up stand-up comedy at that oh, point yeah. in your career? Because a lot of people start with a stand-up and then get into the other things, but right. you've done all these things, had all the success, and then it's like, I want to challenge myself and do something brand new. Yeah. Well, it mainly came from, uh, from having ideas comedically and not having any way to do it. Um, and I started doing improv again, sort of after I got divorced. And I went through, I was really not a happy person. I was kind of depressed and stuff. And then a friend of mine just started saying, go and do improv, go hang out with people that you know from Chicago. And, mm -hmm. and so I started going to UCB and the um, Upright Citizens Brigade, which is in LA, and uh, the Improv Olympic in LA. And I started hanging out with people and then started doing improv again and started looking forward to it. And then, but the thing was, I realized that like, I couldn't put ideas that I had during the week into improv because that's not what improv is, you know. Um, and so I thought, well, I should start, you know, start either doing like one man show things or like just doing things where I can just get ideas out there. Mm -hmm. And that was basically the inspiration behind it. And I sort of put together a show that was a combination of those things. In the beginning, I would come out. I had two friends, Joe Canale and Brad Morris, and we would improvise together as, as three people. But before the show started, I would come out and, and, and talk to the audience, and I would have prepared jokes or things mm -hmm. I thought about during the week. And this was in Chicago at the Improv Olympic, so people paid two bucks to come in and watch it. It wasn't, it wasn't like a high-pressure thing of mm -hmm. like, this show better be great, you know? Um, and then over a period of like a couple years, I went from having no material to having like 20 minutes. And then I kept doing open mics and I kept writing and trying to come up with other stuff. And then before I knew it, I had 45 minutes and I didn't need those other two guys. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so yeah. I fired them and I started going out on my own. Where does it rank as far as like things you like to do, like improv, comedy, 
acting? The, it, I don't know if there's a rank. I think at any time they, each of them um, is as rewarding as the other. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. sometimes when I'm doing <clears throat> improv, when I'm working with really funny people and we're all into it and there's like this magical sort of thing when it's good because it's all of us just making this up and, and making it happen together. And the audience is in on it and it's really magical and great. And there's times when I'm doing stand-up where the, sh the material is working, the audience is great. Um, I go off and talk about other things and the audience is with me and I feel like, you know, this is the best thing ever. Mm -hmm. um, but I never get that feeling when I'm doing film or TV things. It's always, I mean, I enjoy it and yeah. it's like, you have moments of like, oh, I said everything right and I think they got the funny that they mm -hmm. wanted to get. But there's never that moment of like, you know, the live satisfaction media. or reaction mm -hmm. from people. Because even when you're filming stuff, like people don't, the crew won't laugh until they say cut, you know? Um, and then you know, like, oh, they, they like that and they mm -hmm. held out for it. But the, re the live reaction from the audiences um, when you're doing improv or stand up is just, you feel, you feel good, you know? Have you ever had, uh, as you've been working through, through uh, stand up the last eight years, have you ever had it go severely wrong? Severely wrong? Or, where you're just like, man, these guys aren't, aren't getting, getting this had tonight. had a few, yeah. What yeah. do you do there? Just power through it? Yeah, you power through it. You, I talked about it to the audience, and I did a show in Baltimore once, and Baltimore was rough. I'll never go back. <laughs> really? It was rough. It, it wasn't just rough, but it was like the people were mean and mm -hmm. angry. And so... Like heckling the whole time? Not just heckling, but just like commenting after, some, after I'd say something. So I would say something... And it would make it a laugh or whatever. And then somebody in the audience would go, yeah, right. Or something like, you know. Mm -hmm. And then there was a point in this, like, one show I did in Baltimore. And I just said to the audience, like, you guys suck. This is, like, horrible. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not just me. Uh, and then I had to do, like, 15 more minutes or something. And so I said to them, like, I go, you don't deserve me. You really don't. So I turned my back to the audience and sat on the stool and did the rest of my act into the microphone. And I just kept saying the jokes and they started getting into it because I was sort of, you know, being mean to them. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I wasn't like, you know, you guys suck and I like this. I was like, I think I'm better than this. I don't think you're giving me a fair shot. I mm -hmm. think, you know. And so I did like 15 minutes on a stool with my back to the audience. I said, good night. I never looked at them again. I just walked off stage. Wow. But the thing was, it's like, oh yeah, they got into it after I got out of the, you know, um, you know, pulled, you know, like the plane was going down and I was, I pulled it up That's cool. and like landed safely. And yeah, but they were just mean, man. It was funny. What about the Twin Cities audience? Is there anything that sticks out with them as far as their feedback? No, I mean, I think the last time I was here, it was fun. I don't have any like painful memories of playing here. And um, if I did, I would remember. Like, because they stick. Yeah. Baltim I remember Baltimore was one that I had just was like, this is not great. And then I had a show in Mississippi at a casino. It was like Tunica, Mississippi, I think it was called. And it was absolutely horrible. Uh, and so those, those bad gigs, you ask any comedian, Steve Martin, I bet he can tell you like, oh yeah, I had a really horrible show in, you know, Waterloo mm -hmm. or something, you know. But you just go, those, those stick with you, yeah. Do you remember the best show? Where you're like, this is, I'm the best comedian ever. <laughs> yeah, is I mean, one yeah. That, is there one that sticks out? <laughs> no, I mean, I had a whole bunch. <clears throat> I remember being in Bloomington, Indiana. I think it was Bloomington. And it was a small room, about 150 people, something like that. And I was just destroying. And then I started talking to the crowd and I was just, I was in a good mood. Mm -hmm. They were like, you know, it was a lot of college students. So they were like happy to be away from school. And, but I just remember like killing, just absolutely killing. I, I mean, I've gotten standing ovations, I don't know. But in some, some theaters, I've gotten standing ovations and stuff. And mm -hmm. 
those are, um, that's an amazing feeling, you know. Is um, playing Detroit fun? Do you like playing Detroit or do you feel like you do better outside of your hometown? I feel like I do better outside of my hometown. And also feel like I do better when I, I don't know anybody in the audience. Like I hate for friends to come and see me perform. Because you feel like you have to be, well, I feel, they view you a certain way? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like they know me, mm -hmm. whereas these people that are paying to see me don't know me, so they don't know what to expect. Yeah, they're and, probably like, I know Tim, he's not a big deal. I mean, yeah. Well, I grew up with this guy. They're also like, uh, yeah, like anything, I t you know, I don't want to do material, but like any jokes that I do, the audience is, you know, that came to see me, they're like, they're going along for the ride, whereas I feel like my friends and people that know me, family or whatever, their, their judgment of what they're seeing is different. So they're not going to be like laughing and get, having fun as much as they're going to be saying, thinking like, what's true, what's not true, this is not you, this mm -hmm. is you. Um, I do like the joke, speaking of Detroit, uh, where you say, yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm, from a rough part, rough, I'm from the rough part of Detroit. It's called Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> That's good stuff, but it's, nice. but it's getting better, right? Yeah, it the is city. getting better, yeah. It's kind of up and coming and kind of a hit place to be now. Yeah, but they're very sensitive too about what you say about them. Um, and that's something that sort of bugs me about cities and, you know, like, mm -hmm. but because like, I just feel like people get too sensitive about the way other people view them. And, you know, you have to be honest, you know, it's like Detroit is not, you know, it's not Honolulu, mm -hmm. you know, it's not, it's not Florida. It's not Minnesota. It is like, it's its own thing. And it had a really rough period. And there are, you know, neighborhoods where there used to be homes where there are now raccoons. You know, there's like wildlife there, mm -hmm. you know. And, but, but if you act like you can't talk about it, then that's just not right, you know. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I get, I think people in Detroit are too sensitive. And like, actually I did, I was on Colbert and I did that joke. And I wasn't even planning on it and he wasn't expecting me to do it. And the and people laughed or whatever, and then the fucking I'm sorry. No, it's, it's fine. And then the fucking headline from Detroit Free Press and Detroit News, Tim Tim Meadows, uh, you know, rips Detroit on Colbert. And I was like, I did one joke about yeah. Detroit, and then the rest of the time, I, I had talked to, like at the end of the interview, a friend of mine had been in a car accident who was from Detroit who I'd known forever, and I said to him like. You know, I just want to say, get, be get better, we, care, we love you, blah, blah, blah. The fucking article never mentioned that I brought that up. Mm -hmm. The only thing, or, or that I brought up the fact that I was on a TV show, or the news to them was that he rips Detroit on Colbert. And it was like, it was such a harmless joke, you know? And, yeah. and so, to, out of spite, I bought a condo in Detroit. <laughs> it's like, I'll show you assholes. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be back. here every day, and uh, you have to deal nice. with me. All right, so Son of Zorn, mm -hmm. great, great show. What was it like acting with a comic book character or a, a comic character? Nothing there. Yeah. Was, what, what, what was there? Was there anything there? What, how did you know where to look? There was no, nothing there. And I loved that show <laughs> and loved doing it. It was a great cast of people. We had so much fun and we didn't start understanding exactly how, what we were doing until like the third or fourth episode. And we only got to do eight, I think. But when the, we had a stand-in, and the guy who was a stand-in was really funny, and he could improvise, and he was a really nice guy, and so we... So there was a person there? Well, we would rehearse it with a person okay. there, and we would block it, so it would be like, Zorn is going to walk from here to there, and so the guy would do that. And we would practice like watching him walk. And then you had to remember? We had to remember. Oh, and so the, they would put little marks like, so when he stands here, you're looking here. Mm -hmm. When he's sitting here, you're looking here. And so they'd put a piece of tape on the back wall or whatever. Okay. But then during some of the rehearsals, the, I can't I want to think of it, I can't remember his name, but he's so funny. But during rehearsals, if we went off book and improvised something, he was just as funny as everybody else and could improvise really well. And so we would have changes because he would say something mm -hmm. and it would get into the show, you know? That's cool. um, and it got better 
as we, we did it because we liked him. And so it looked like we were actually acting or talking to somebody who we actually liked. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? So it, it changed. Um, but it was a fun show to do. With, uh, with streaming and, and so many opportunities to do unique things like you guys did the Rose Parade, yeah. do you think there's a chance that, that that show could get picked up somewhere? Netflix, Prime, something like that? I doubt it. I think, mm-hmm. I don't know, I just think the consumption for things, like they just, like people are, I don't know, I think people are used to, you know, if something coming out, if it doesn't hit and we don't see it anymore, we're fine because mm-hmm. we got Breaking Bad or we're yeah. going to watch something else, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't think people like really care about those kind of things as opposed to like when Family Guy went through that thing in the beginning where they, it was on air, mm-hmm. it went off air, people started circulating DVDs of the show and, mm-hmm. it, and they were like, well, what the, what, we had a hit here and then they brought it back and then it ran forever. Um, I don't think that like happens much anymore. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I don't know. All right. Well, I know there's a lot of fans out there, so that's why I thought of that. That that could happen. It is but weird. We'll it is. They, there's a lot of fans for it. Mm-hmm. I'm kind of surprised. Tim. All right. So this next question is a fan question, and it's definitely a pop culture reference with things that have been going on recently. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you've, you've, how much you've been following Twitter and stuff like that the last couple of days, but so Kanye West has been tw- tweeting pro Trump um, tweets and a hat with the Make America Great Again hat, and then Chance the Rapper said <clears throat> not all, something to the effect that not all black people have to vote for Democrats. And I guess my question for you, based on our, this guy's question for you, Nick Hulse is, is the person asking the question. Mm-hmm. As a fellow very successful black entertainer, do you feel like there is, like Kanye said, a lack of freedom of thought in the entertainment industry and or the black culture? Uh, no, I don't. I think even that idea that like all black people vote Democrat or, you know, whatever, or we are Republican or, or are re- Democrats. Uh, I think even that statement is sort of not real because I think it's, I, 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 I think it's like an individual thing. I don't know. Um, I don't think like, I think, uh, it's weird, but I think African Americans they vote their conscience more than most people. I mean, we got President Trump. That was not a vote of people out of the goodness of their hearts, thinking like this is the guy that's going to be a great, you know, like leader. It was like a vote of we want change, and we, you know, um, and we're angry because we feel like we've been left behind, or you know, whatever. Um, but I don't know, like my family or friends, African-American friends, like we don't talk about like, we're all Democrats. It's just like Mm -hmm. individually, like you make a choice just like everybody else. And Mm -hmm. it's an obvious choice that African-Americans have made a, um, effort to support Democrats because it feels like the Democratic Party reaches out to African-American communities. If Republicans did it more, and it was like an obvious, um, tangible movement that you could feel from the Republicans, African-Americans would support Republicans. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, you know, um, I don't know, I just think like grouping, Kanye West doesn't know how I vote, and Chance the Rapper doesn't know how I vote, you know, um, so yeah, I don't know what okay. else. All right, so I guess I've kind of touched on this question already a little bit, but you've had some, a long period of success. It would, seems like it would be easy to just kind of take it easy. Mm-hmm. Why do you keep working so hard? What is it inside of you that, gives, that continues to give you that energy to keep doing what you're, what you're doing? Um, I don't know, probably the same sort of thing that got me started, which was I had just got to do that. You mm-hmm. know, it's like, I'm, I don't feel like I'm like satisfied or like creatively finished or anything. Um, and also I have kids and I think, you know, I need to get ready to pay for colleges. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, 
I'd also like to like uh, retire comfortably one day. Uh, even though my therapist said that I'll never retire, he goes, "You'll you'll go insane if you retire. Like you, you can always tell that have you something." Have the, the drive to yeah, just keep just, going. Some some people you just have the drive to be creative in some way or the other, and it's not about not financially, but it's like you got to have an outlet. Mm -hmm. Like even with stand up, it was like I had to do it because I was going nuts, not being able to you know. Uh, talk and be funny or get ideas out there and see if they were yeah. funny. All right. Well, speaking of being busy, you're doing stand up here this weekend. Mm -hmm. Also, you have some upcoming projects here just from IMDb. I found these. There might be more. Yeah. The Goldbergs, which you're a regular on there. Schooled, Man with a Plan, and then an untitled CBS project. Mm -hmm. Tell us what you have coming on the horizon. Well, I yeah, the Schooled uh, spinoff from the Goldbergs got picked up for, oh, by cool. ABC for 13 episodes. So we're gonna do that later this summer. So will your, will your role expand in that or? Yeah, I mean, it's basic. I don't know what the show will be. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a workplace comedy with the teachers inv more involved. Kids but um, but it's my kids character and Brian, and, um, uh, Brian Callen the coach is the coach character. It's a spinoff for those, char for those characters. So it's kind of a uh, we'll see what happens course, with it. You know, you mm -hmm. um, the and then I did a pilot for CBS that uh, is uh, with Damon Wayans Jr. Um, but that was, you know, sort of like, I don't know, I just work. So like, I just keep throwing whatever sticks, you know, mm -hmm. I just keep putting stuff out there. Um, but the main things I'm doing is that the Goldberg spinoff, and then I have a show for CBS uh, streaming that is called No Activity. And uh, we just got picked up for a second season. Um, and that's a really fun show to do. I don't know if you've seen it or no, not yet. It's it's great. It's based on an Australian show, and it's about two cops sitting in a um, on um, their state on stakeout, and the, all the scenes that I'm in is just me and another guy sitting in a car, and the scenes will last for like ten minutes. We're just telling stories. We have dialogue, and um, sounds and, like Seinfeld. Just yeah, the, it's like the conversations he, that they would have in the restaurant, you know, yeah. it's just, there's not a lot happening. It's just okay. the writing yes. makes it happen. Exactly what it is. It's, so it's my, my character and his partner, and then the other characters are two um, operators at the, in the call center. And so we're checking in with them while we're on stakeout. And then they have scenes together where they're talking, getting to know each other. And then the other scenes um, are with two crooks that we're actually staking out watching. But they're inside of a warehouse and they don't know we're watching them. And it's and their scenes are about the relationships between them. And so you have it's a show where you'd have three or four scenes with only two people talking. But there is a plot that goes on that connects everybody eventually. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it was another thing Will Ferrell's company produced and they hired me for. And it's cool. it's great. So it's funny or die? Funny or die, okay. yeah. Do you have anything on your bucket list that you want to create or definitely do at some point? <sighs> no, not really. Okay. I mean, I was talking earlier about like how much I love the Tiny House show. Mm -hmm. You know, Tiny Houses. On HGTV? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, and I was thinking like I'd love to get a tiny house and uh, move somewhere like Maui or... So that's the only other... You just bought a condo though. I know. I'm just, but... I gotta keep... That's why I gotta keep working. <laughs> I got too many monthly bills. Do you have a favorite role that you've done? Uh, no, I mean, Ladies Man was probably the most fun in general, and Mean Girls, I think, was also a lot of fun, and I, I feel like those two things are really connected with as an actor, and the writing and everything was good. Will Ladies Man ever come back? Uh, no. Really? No. Okay. Uh, He's retired? No, I just, if the opportunity was there, I'm not going to create the opportunity. If they came to me and said, like Netflix, if they were like, we want to do a, you know, a Kwanzaa special starring a ladies man, then I'd go, yeah, mm -hmm. which is actually a good idea. <laughs> Let's write that down. Yeah. Uh, so w will you be hosting SNL anytime soon? No. Okay. No. I'm not okay. a big enough star to host uh, I don't know about that. I'm not. One thing I thought was really interesting every time I hear, and I because I heard your impression of Lauren Michaels mm -hmm. and all of the other impressions that I've heard by castmates, it sounded like um, his his voice sounded exactly like Doctor Evil. 
Yeah, right. Is that voice, did, do you know if, if that's where the voice came from for, for that um, character? I think it is, yes. Okay. I, didn't, I don't want to, you know, but I think. Was he a Dr. Evil type? Type person or no but okay. he was he had a lot of he had a lot of power and the way that he talked to you though made it seem like he didn't have a lot of power so um but he had a lot of um opinions and um and you knew most of the time that he was right you know mm -hmm. um but yeah, Mike, I, I, I can't say yes, he did or no, he didn't. But yeah, it does remind me of Lauren. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, Tim Meadows, thanks for being here. Yeah, I appreciate thank you. it. Bet. And Twin Cities, make sure you check this guy out. He's going to be at the Joke Joint this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. JokeJointComedyClub.com. Thanks for being here. How long did this last? Because it was way um, longer than I was expecting. <laughs> well, I think you got here at 10 and it's 11.01. So I, I took advantage of it. Sorry, sorry. You did. Once we got you in the chair, it was like. You know, when, before you get here, it's like it's going to take five minutes. And then when you get, we get here, we lock, we lock the door uh, and our know security's what? out there. I changed my mind. You are ready for New York or LA. <laughs> nice.